That's my mic. Yeah, kids can go for Connect Kids. It's their last uh, last lesson in the series they're doing today. Start a new series next week. A couple things uh, before we jump into our message today. First of all, um, thank you to those who came last Sunday night and were a part of our seminar, um, Goodbye Generation. Uh, I think it was uh, just an excellent time to have uh, a conversation about, um, you know, the, how we reach teens and young adults and uh, really just, uh, in some ways, the beginning of a conversation that uh, not only our church is having, but the churches together in the city uh, going to be talking about this, and uh, I think it was, uh, how many found that helpful last Sunday night that we're here? Yeah, it was good. And we had uh, about five or six churches represented here last week, so that was awesome, and uh, we want to keep pressing into that. that if, we don't, uh, uh, if we don't make significant advances to reach that generation, it doesn't happen by accident. It happens by intentionality, and we need, to, we need to be intentional about it. Amen? I heard one amen, so you, that's, I got one. You and me and Jesus, we're good. All right, the other thing that I wanted to mention. Um, we don't, um, this is a little... A little sensitive, just because we, uh, I would like to make the names known for, that are candidates for our board. Um, and we do so, of course, uh, this, the church is not a democracy. I don't know if you understand that. The church is not a democracy. It's, it's the body of Jesus, and although we, we vote on some things, that doesn't mean it's a democracy. It means that, um, it means that it's, uh, voting in the church is a way of establishing unity around a decision. It's not about... See, in, de in a democracy, you campaign for your whatever, and you campaign for this and that. And you, you, you know, once you get voted and elected to a board, then, or to a to a pos political position in, in the world, in democracy, you, you represent the people that got you voted. That's not what the church is all about, right? We understand? This is not, about, this is not a political thing. This is about determining the will of God and the unity around decisions that we make. And, uh, and so, yeah, to share the names with with you ahead of time is so that you can be praying, not so that conversations happen and, and that we get political about this, because that's not what this is about, right? We, do we understand that? We're all, I think we're all mature enough to, to understand that. So, uh, so we have two positions to fill and three names to present to you. And in alphabetical order according to their last name, um, Suzanne Obi, Mike Couture, and Paul Whalen have let their names stand. So uh, those are three names, Suzanne Obe, Mike Couture, and Paul Whalen are letting their names stand. And we'll please be in prayer uh, for our business meeting and um, see what the Lord will do. Amen? Good. Good, good. All right, with all of this snow, I thought we needed a, uh, uh, something to warm us up this morning. So a little, little joke, um, Bubba and Bo, two good old boys from the south, 
are sitting on the porch. And they see a truck roll by with rolls and rolls and rolls of sod on the back of it, heading somewhere. I'm going to do that when I win the lottery, Bubba says to Bo. Bo says, do what? Send my lawn out to get cut. Oh, boy. Who wants to send their driveway out to get uh, cleared, right? Yep. All right. So the next installment of our, uh, our series, this is, uh, this is all about lifting up Jesus. We're, we're digging into the Gospel of John and looking at uh, the person of Jesus and the statements that he has made through the Gospel of John, seven I am statements, and uh, that, that reveal his character, that reveal who he is, and seven miracles, or what does John call them? Anybody? No? Signs? Remember that? Signs? Yes? Yeah, you remember? Okay. Um, John calls all of the miracles that, that he pulls out of Jesus' life and ministry, he calls them signs because they point to the glory of Jesus. They point to who he is. They point to his majesty. They point to the fact that he is not just a teacher that came to teach. He is the Son of God. Right? Yes. Okay, this is going to work a lot better if you're working with me here. The quieter you are, the longer we go. Just, just, just saying. All right? Amen. All right. Now you got it. Okay. So we're going to be in John chapter 6 this morning. And actually both the I am statement and the miracle happen in John chapter 6. And they're very connected today. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, let's read quickly. I will try to read in high speed. If you can put on your seatbelts and follow me. John 6, verse 1. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had, been, he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat. He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, If it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves, left over from those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. <clears throat> so, Go, bread of life. Uh, we know from the other Gospels 
that this, this sign, this miracle, took place in a very low and painful time in Jesus' life. Um, the, the same miracle is described in the other Gospels. It's actually one of the only miracles that we find in all four Gospels. And so we have different perspectives on this, this event that happened. And we know that Jesus had just found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been executed. And really, for the most part, because of him. Because his whole job, John the Baptist's whole job in life was to prepare the way for Jesus, and it was because of him that John was killed. He, uh, he crossed, <clears throat> so he crossed the Sea of Galilee to get away on a retreat with his friends because he was so um, just impacted by this, by this news. He went to get away on a retreat with his friends and people followed him there from all over the region. He couldn't get away. And when, they, when he saw them coming, Matthew tells us that he had compassion on them. So he's trying to get away. People are coming, but they, they're coming with needs and burdens and Jesus has compassion on them and Luke says he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing Jesus in a in a a sad and broken place himself steps out of that and ministers to people who are in need let's notice this morning that kingdom opportunities sometimes come at the worst possible moments for our convenience. Right? And we have to be ready to turn every situation into an opportunity. Our life doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the Lord. And when opportunities come, we can't... We can't determine when that's going to happen and sometimes they come at very difficult times and if we are prepared if we've spent time preparing our lives for those moments then even if it's a difficult moment we will be able to step out of our need and into serving someone else's um i remember uh just a a couple years ago going to visit a friend in the hospital and uh, uh, he had just had bypass surgery. And this guy would tell, uh, talk about Jesus to anything that breathed. And, uh, and so he's, he's talking to the doctors. He's talking to the nurses. And he leads the guy in the bed beside him to Jesus. And here I'm going to visit this guy because he's just had bypass surgery. And he's in a difficult place. But he... he maximize that opportunity and serve Jesus in the midst of it, right? And that's the, that's the kind of life that, that we are called to. But also notice that Jesus, Jesus did take care of himself eventually. It says that he, he, he got away and, uh, and spent some time by himself after this. Um, <clears throat> this... Miracle is the most misnamed miracle in the Gospels. Because we call it the feeding of the 5,000. But Scripture tells us that there were 5,000 men, right? And then um, Matthew's Gospel lets us in on why why they say specifically 5,000 men because there were women and children besides that. Um, so obviously, you know, they, they, they were only used to counting men's heads for some reason, but there were women and children there as well. So, so if, if everyone, you know, on average, if every man brought a plus one or a plus two, right, you we're, we're conservatively talking about ten to 15,000 people. Right? Does that make sense? And, uh, 
They've been listening to Jesus for hours, and Jesus asks Philip, who we see from other places in Scripture too, he's the pragmatist. He's always got the answer, you know, he's trying to figure out the answer to stuff. He asks the pragmatist, where are we going to find bread for all these people to eat? And Philip gets out his calculator, right? And he starts adding up. He's like, Jesus, I don't know, this isn't, this isn't adding up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost more than half a year's wages to buy enough for each person to have a bite. Let's put it a little bit in today's figures, okay? If you had 15 people that you're buying pizza for, it would easily, easily cost $50, right? Probably way more, but just, just for easy figuring... If you're feeding Cameron, okay. <laughs> there he goes, one pizza. Um, so you're feeding 15 people easily $50. So 15,000 people would cost $50,000. That's a lot of money, right? Um. And, and so, and even if, even if you could, you know, you had enough money to buy that much pizza, there's not a pizza joint in Bathurst that's going to be able to pump out that many pizzas, right? <laughs> You're going to be like next month finishing lunch from this month. Um, so that's a lot of food. And it's no wonder Philip is thinking, Jesus, you're, you're cracked. You know, you're upset about John and, and you're just lost it, right? Um, and, and yet, how ridiculous is it that, uh, that Andrew pipes up and he's like, we got a two-piece fish meal over here, Right? Two, two, lo- two fishes, and five loaves, small loaves, barley bread. We got a two-piece fish meal over here, right? Where, where Philip, when he saw the situation, all he saw was the impossibilities in the situation. When Andrew saw the situation, all he saw was possibilities, He didn't know how it was going to happen, but he knew somehow this little fish meal had to be the answer. That God was going to use this situation. Where Philip saw it, he saw impossibilities. Where Andrew saw it, he saw possibilities. Everyone say, I want to be an Andrew. I want to be an Andrew. I want to be somebody who sees the circumstances of my life and sees the circumstances around me and doesn't see the impossibilities, but sees that God's already prepared an answer in the midst of the problem. God has stashed a promise in the middle of every problem. He doesn't let us walk into problems that he doesn't already know the answer to. And so, I want to be an Andrew. Good thing I already am. But I want to be an Andrew that sees the possibilities, that sees that God... We can... uh, Some of you were reading Numbers this week, uh, if you were following along in the Bible reading, and... and, um, You know, we're reading about the Israelites in the desert and they whine and they whine and they whine and they whine, right? They whine about no water and no food and the food doesn't taste as good and we want meat and and just over and over. And we can't go into the land because they're giants in there and they're just whining and whining. We can be like the people of Israel that even in the midst of God's provision, only saw trouble. Or we can be like Andrew, who even in the midst of scarcity and impossibility, sees the hand of God. And that's our choice. We choose that response. 
So throughout this miracle, Jesus was training His disciples. Luke tells us that they had just gotten back from a short-term mission outreach where they had gone out two by two into the towns all around Galilee, preaching the gospel, preaching about the kingdom, and healing people in the power of God. And Jesus now wants to stretch them to the next level. And, and the, verse, the verses we read says that Jesus asked Philip the question, what are we, how are we going to feed these people? Where are we going to find the bread? Because he was testing him. He's, he's equipping, he's training his disciples. He already knows what he's going to do. But he's equipping and training his disciples in the process. He involves the disciples in the miracle, as we see in the other Gospels. When, when the bread and fish are still in Jesus' hands, it's just still two fish and five loaves of bread broken into smaller pieces. We used to play that trick with our kids. Right? You got a, you got a, a cookie. I want two cookies. Okay, snap it in half and give them two. Right? That works. It works for one kid, but it doesn't work so well for 15,000 people, right? Um, when it was in Jesus' hands, it was still two fish and five loaves, broken into pieces and handed out to the disciples. But as they walk out into the crowd by faith, and that's the, it's got to be the weirdest walk of their lives. we got this little bit of food, and we're walking out, to this big crowd of people and they're talking to each other like, I don't know what to do. You know what to do? Like, what are we going to do with this? this is... and, and they walk out into the crowd and as they go and start to hand it out by faith, Jesus told us to do it. We're just being obedient by faith. And as they hand it out, it, hey, there's, there's still more. And, and they keep handing it out until everybody's fed and stuffed and there's more left over. Right? And it's, it's as they go that the miracle happens. Miracles happen as we go. Sometimes we wonder, why aren't we seeing as many miracles in our culture today, through God's people today? And the question is, are we going? Are we going? Are we taking risks of faith? Are we stepping outside of what makes sense to us to do what doesn't make sense by faith so that God can do what only God can do? Right? We can't sit in our lazy boy. I love, I love lazy boys. They're good. But we can't sit in our lazy boy and say, how come God's not doing miracles? Right? We need, we need to go. There's time for lazy boys and there's times to go. And we need, we need to go. And as we go, God will do miracles. Jesus is going to lead us to do some crazy things some things that don't add up financially, some things that don't make sense to our, our figure-outer, to our make sense It just don't make sense to us. And yet, He's calling us to step out by faith and watch what He does. So Jesus, our, the first miracle we looked at, Jesus turned the water to wine. We saw that Jesus was Lord of the atoms and the elements of this universe. The second miracle we looked at was the healing of an official's son from a distance. We realized Jesus is Lord of time and space. Last week, we didn't get to the miracle because uh, it just didn't happen that way. But it would have been 
about a guy, a crippled guy who had been crippled for 40 years by the pool. And Jesus came and, and healed him. And, uh, and we would have seen that, that Jesus is the Lord of restoring what was lost. And today, we see that Jesus is Lord of the impossible. He is Lord of the impossible. The, uh, the miracle that we see here takes place in a wilderness area. It's in a wilderness area. It's a miracle of supernatural provision of bread and meat. Does that sound familiar from anywhere else in Scripture? Right? Well, the Last Supper, sure. But I'm talking about way back before. How about God's provision of manna and quail in the wilderness? Right? Um, this miracle is, as I said, recorded in all four Gospels. And it's significant because the Gospel writers see Jesus as the new Moses. He's the bringer of the new covenant. God had told Moses, there will be another prophet like you that will come. And he was talking about Jesus. Moses was a forerunner, a foreshadowing of Jesus who would come. And he would bring a new covenant. And so the symbolism in this miracle is that God is providing a new kind of manna for His people. In Jesus, God is providing a new kind of manna. John 1 verse 17 says, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The manna in the Old Testament was never only about food. It was about a relationship of dependency and trust between God and His people. Remember, they, they collected manna every day. And only enough for that day because God was going to provide manna tomorrow. And some of them tried to collect extra because they didn't trust that. And it got wormy and gross. Rotten. Right? And then, uh, then they, they learned that lesson. But God said, on the Sabbath, you're not, I'm not going to send it. I'm, just be warned. Right? Kind of like the time change warning. Just be warned. This is happening. Um, I'm not going to send manna on the Sabbath. So collect twice as much the day before, and that manna will last. Right? And it did. But some people didn't trust that. Oh, it's going to come tomorrow. And they didn't collect enough. And they were hungry on the Sabbath. Right? And, and so they learned some lessons about God's provision and about being obedient and walking and trusting God. The manna in the Old Testament was all about this trust relationship with God. And Jesus comes to bring a new kind of manna. Jesus is the better bread. Chapter 6, verse 25. So, after the feeding of the 5,000 or the 15,000 or however many there were, um, Jesus walks on the water. We'll come to that later. And uh, then when they found Him on the other side of the lake, they asked Him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for Me not because you saw the signs 
I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on Him God the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they asked Him, What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the One He has sent. So they asked Him, What sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it is My Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. So, <clears throat> these people, they're not uh, the disciples, they're just other followers and people who want to, to hear Jesus teach. And Jesus says to them, you're, not, you're, you're looking for Me, not because you saw the signs I performed, not because you really believed in the miracles that I did, but because I gave you lots of food. I filled your tummies. You want some more of that, right? Um, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. And then down in verse 34, they say, Sir, always give us this bread. See, bread has always been a staple diet, staple of diet for cultures all over the world and for centuries, for millennia. But in the, in the time of the first century Palestine, it was, it was even more of an essential part of their diet. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, meat. I, I haven't had a meal unless I've had meat. I don't know about you. Some vegetarians in the house, I guess. But um, we, we have all kinds of meat and vegetables available to us um, relatively cheaply because of our the culture and, and the way uh, society is here. But in Palestine... Red meat was a luxury that was kept for special uh, occasions and feast days. And, uh, and vegetables were not as, as easy sometimes to come by. Bread was, bread was the thing. And bread was not just picked up at the supermarket. You don't just go get bread at the supermarket. You plant wheat. You water it. You grow it. You harvest it. You thresh it. You grind it. You make it into bread, into dough, you bake it. That's a lot of work, right? And that's why these people are going, sir, always give us this bread. We, we, it's, it's like the woman at the well who says, sir, give me that water that never stops because I don't want to come back here to the well all the time. And they're saying, give us that bread that, that always you know, satisfies hunger so we don't have to keep planting and threshing and grinding and making bread, right? Um, it, it, it's kind of like hitting the jackpot. I think if Jesus did this, did, you know, had this conversation today, he might say, um, you know, don't. Uh, they'd be like, we, we hit the jackpot, you know. And Jesus would be like, if you really, if you really want to win the lottery, if you really want to win the lot lottery, gamble. If you really want to take a gamble, gamble on me. Because I'll pay off every time. If you want to take a gamble, gamble on me. Right? Um, so Jesus says, work for food. Don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that is eternal. Many of the things that promise fulfillment to us today. This is what Jesus is saying. 
Many of the things that promise fulfillment to us today leave us hungry right afterwards. Entertainment. Trying to, trying to get you know, our soul filled by a relationship. By drugs or alcohol. By money. By a job. By a family. By the latest gadget. Even by doing humanitarian work. All the things we try to fill our soul with, in the end, there's still a hunger. Because Jesus is the only one that can fill that place in our heart. He's the only one that can give us the food that lasts into eternity, that feeds us and we don't get hungry again. A lot of times, midlife crises happen when we get have, you know, well through our lives and we realize all the things we were counting on to bring us peace aren't working. Now what do we do? Right? Now what do we do? We were made to hunger for God and for Him alone and to be satisfied with Him. But as long as we deny or ignore Him as our source, as the one that we feed on, we will have a voracious appetite for things that bring temporary satisfaction. Isaiah 55, verses 1-3 to says this, Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat, Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen. Listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Doesn't that sound a lot like Jesus' words to these people? So Jesus is the better bread. Verse 35. Oh, sorry. hate it when I don't keep up for you. Jesus said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is the heavenly bread. He says, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will. This is verse 38. Not to do my will, for I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of Him who sent me, not to lose any that were given and to raise them up at the last day. So Jesus came down to do the will of His Father, to not lose any that were given to Him, and to raise them up at the last day. In fact, three times in verse 39... Verse 40, verse 44, Jesus talks about raising us up. It's interesting. The resurrection, the resurrection is what we hope for. That, when you live in such a way that you are ready for the resurrection, that is what will fill our soul. That is what will feed you and will last. To live for the resurrection. We're going to, get, we're going to talk a lot more about the resurrection on Easter Sunday when we get to uh, that miracle. And, and Jesus will say, I am the resurrection and the life. But we live for the resurrection. There is coming a day when Jesus will return and all those who have died in Him 
will be raised up to life. Eternal life. And, and so our hope is in the resurrection. <clears throat> we... Uh, Okay, we need to speed this up. Um, I heard that, Pam. So people get upset. They're like, how could he have come down from heaven? We know this guy. And uh, Jesus says in verse 48... I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And they get kind of grossed out, kind of freaked out. Is he talking about cannibalism? What's he saying? What's he talking about? And they're not understanding what Jesus is saying, that, that they, need to, uh, they need to believe in the One who is broken for the world. They need to, to fill their lives with Him. And so, they get upset. And Jesus... Um, they get upset and Jesus pushes even more. And then they grumble and Jesus pushes even more. He doesn't back off. Like Jesus, Jesus would fail at every church growth seminar that you've ever seen. Because when, when people get upset at His message, if He was, if he was smart, he would change his message so they didn't get upset anymore. Right? But he doesn't. He, he makes it even stronger and stronger until everyone walks away except for his 12 closest friends. Everyone walks away except for his 12 closest friends. And once there's only 12 left, Jesus says in verse 67, you don't want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon was saying, Jesus, I don't understand any of this, but I'm willing to give up everything that I am and everything that I have to hang on to your words because you have the words of life. Amen? I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to turn to the, to the table. And as we... Um